1964, as part of its founding mission to encourage the dissemination of significant aviation information, the Wings Club created the annual site lecture. It was initiated by Club President General Harold R. Harris to, quote, provide the opportunity for an outstanding contributor to the advancement of aviation to discuss his or her views on past, present, and future aviation topics with hindsight, insight, and foresight. It's very fitting then that we have Bob Crandall as our 45th site lecture speaker. It'll come as no surprise to any of you that the Wall Street Journal called Bob, quote, the man who changed the way the world flies, end quote. And as we all know, that is in fact certainly true. During his 25-year tenure at American Airlines, he was instrumental in introducing changes which revolutionized the travel industry. Just a few of these innovations that Bob introduced include the modernization of American Sabre computer reservation system, which eventually became the Sabre Group. Creation of Super Saver fares for advanced ticket purchases. Development of the first yield management system, big deal. And creation of the American Airlines Advantage, the industry's first frequent flyer program. In addition, he also launched an expansion program that tripled American size and transformed it from a medium-sized domestic carrier to one of the world's leading international airlines. So ladies and gentlemen, it is my great honor to welcome Mr. Bob Crandall. Thank you, Jack. I appreciate it. Thank you all. Thank you very much, John, and thank you all for coming out to have lunch with us today. It's always a pleasure to be at the Wings Club because I, I like aviation. I've got a lot of old friends here, made some new friends today, and it's always fun to be able to talk about the business. John just explained to you what Barry Eccleston explained to me when he asked me to do this. I said to him, what is this site lecture business? I have never understood it. And so he explained the three sites. And as I was thinking about what might be appropriate to talk to you about, I decided to simply ignore hindsight. Since after all, you and I have shared a lot of the history of the recent aviation, uh, recent aviation developments. As for foresight, it has always seemed to me that whenever I make a prediction, I surround it with so many caveats that the whole meaning is lost. I have therefore decided to become a, a fan of Will Rogers' old saying, and Will used to say, never make predictions, especially about the future. The remaining site, of course, is insight, which suggests a focus on what the industry is today and what it should be tomorrow. Reality on the one hand and aspirations on the other. Reality, of course, is what it is. While aspirations describe the things that the industry should seek to accomplish, for its own sake, for the sake of its customers, and for the sake of the large and growing contribution it makes to the U.S. economy. In the years that have elapsed since I was last at the Wings Club, the most dramatic change in reality has been the long-awaited consolidation of multiple major carriers. In the space of a decade, an intensely competitive industry has morphed into a seller's market in which four mega carriers control about 80% of US originating passengers. And while the industry remains competitive in an academic sense, the bare knuckle, bare -knuckle brawls that characterized the first 35 years of deregulation have very largely vanished. In my day, managements aspired to single digit operating returns. Today's managements luxuriate in double-digit returns on equity, an outcome surpassing our wildest dreams back in the day. So while the economics of the business have changed dramatically, there is also a lot that hasn't changed very much. The business remains uniquely capital and labor 
and <clears throat> fuel intensive. And because the FAA operates the national airspace system, airlines are uniquely and adversely impacted by the political conflicts that seem to rage endlessly in Washington. The industry's product has evolved a bit and growth has continued, fortunately because there is no indication that the public wants to travel less. Bill Frankie told you a couple of months ago that more consolidation is on the horizon, and I am inclined to agree with him, both domestically and internationally. Consolidation has clearly had very favorable economic insight, impacts for the carriers, and as a consequence, I think further consolidation seems quite likely. In addition to continued growth and consolidation, I think we're going to see much more intensive use of automated tools and te techniques intended to cut costs on the one hand and facilitate the customer experience on the other. Things like boarding the aircraft without manual intervention and single biometric ID acceptance at all of the checkpoints along the way, real-time trip information streamed to handheld devices, and permanent baggage tags linked to customer profiles are all in the works. And there are more good ideas, doubtless percolating in various planning shops as we speak. The reality of today will therefore be gradually modified as those three trends, growth and consolidation and automation, continue into the future. Unhappily, if evolution is all we get, the industry's major problems are going to go unresolved. Evolution is not going to resolve issues like deeply dissatisfied customers, inadequate and uncertain Funding, funding sources, an, out, an outmoded airspace management system, deteriorating airports, and an intrusive and overpriced security system. Nor will it provide proactive responses to other problems, including unfair international competition, public disquiet about aircraft tracking, and what appears to be a developing pilot shortage. Those are important issues because the industry is a major factor in the U.S. economy, contributing more than 5% of U.S. GDP and supporting, in one way or another, more than 11 million jobs. Those are very impressive numbers, which impose, in my view, a heavy responsibility on the industry's leadership. While government is certainly going to have to help as the industry seeks to resolve these problems, the industry itself is going to need to provide the impetus, the expertise, and the passion needed to assure action. One of the problems the industry ought to be thinking about is how to do a better job of satisfying its customers, who are pretty broadly unhappy. The New Yorker, some of you may have seen this article, on December the 26th carried an article which posited that the airlines provide terrible service in order to incentivize customers to pay fees to get something better. Now, I hope and believe that article was tongue-in-cheek, but there is little doubt that many airline customers are very deeply dissatisfied. The American Customer Satisfaction Index rates the airlines 20th out of the 22 industries it tracks. Only internet service providers and cable companies <laughs> get lower marks. Passenger complaints include indifferent employees, hidden fees, late and canceled flights, cramped seating, delayed and lost luggage, frequent flyer programs that don't deliver promised benefits, fewer service options, and incompetent complaint resolutions. To be candid, I think it is unlikely that airline customers are ever going to think as well of us as we think they should. Top of the league satisfaction, customer satisfaction, is probably an unrealistic aspiration. I used to have a lot of fun when I was out on the rubber chicken circuit, and I would say to people when they complained about the seats or the food that the problem was them. 
that the seats were the way they were and the food was the way it is or was because that's all customers would pay for. And there was a lot of booing and hissing. <laughs> but the fact is, you all know that's true. Lots of airline executives, myself included, have tried wider seats and better food only to find that it attracts no market share whatsoever. Price was and remains the driver. Airline customers persistently opt for the cheapest seat at the cheapest available price. And that is why carriers continue to jam more seats into their airplanes. But ac acknowledging the public's preference for price over nicety does not preclude using technology to improve the product and to make the travel experience more enjoyable. In-flight connectivity, just to cite an example, has recently become a reality on most domestic aircraft. And it is beginning to appear on international flights as well. While connectivity is already highly valued by those who have to keep up with the constant flow of business minute to minute, its utility for non-business travelers, for airline crews, and for the airlines themselves has been limited to date by the slow speeds imposed by inadequate bandwidth and early stage technologies. In the next few years, technological advances, which are now being perfected and installed by GOGO, and here I should, in, in the interest of full disclosure, say I am a director of GOGO, installed by GOGO and others, all right, will greatly increase the speed and utility of both air to ground and satellite linkages. As speeds increase, crews will, are going to be able to do a better job for customers. Customers are going to be able to enjoy more entertainment options, and airlines will be able to gather more information about planes in flight than has been possible in the past. And the result ought to be fewer delays and lower costs, which will in turn mean more satisfied customers. Nor does working hard at delivering the best value require skimping on essentials like first-rate baggage handling and tracking systems, training people well enough to do a better job of resolving complaints, paying enough to attract willing and trainable personnel, and being sure that frequent flyer programs deliver what they promise. To achieve those goals, I think the industry ought to abandon some of the outsourcing it has pursued so aggressively and allocate a bit more cash flow to labor and a bit less to capital. Doing so, in my view, would generate widespread public approval while benefiting both employees and customers. In recent years, there has been a lot of litigation involving airline efforts to limit the penetration of travel agents and other distributors who offer specialized tools like customized corporate booking tools, comparison shopping activities, and customized tracking and accounting systems. Some of those are outside the core competence of airlines, and I have therefore had my doubts about the wisdom of those quarrels. Nevertheless, it is perfectly clear that airlines have no obligation to make their products available to all distributors. And litigation may indeed be the only way to sort out obsolete agreements about who gets paid, how much, to do what. However those disputes come out, however, I think the airlines will be far better off adopting complete transparency in those channels they elect to use. Consumers ought to be able to determine, without any fancy gymnastics, the full price of a given trip, including the fare as well as any and all ancillary charges that might be required. I think the industry can do better by its customers than it has. And I'm encouraged by the increasing frequency of articles suggesting that at least some of the industry's CEOs agree with that view. I hope they will succeed. In other areas, we need to do a lot more than simply move up the ladder of satisfaction. When I retired, way back in 1998, we were arguing about how to accelerate the progress of NextGen. 
about how to provide a sustainable, long-term way of financing the national aviation system, and about how to insulate the ATO from the political turmoil inherent in a system which is funded by taxes and supervised, God forbid, by Congress. <laughs> we are still arguing about those same things. And despite lots of rhetoric from all sides, from general aviation, the several airport groups, the airlines, and the government, we are headed towards a September reauthorization, September of 2015 reauthorization date without any firm plan for properly financing our aviation infrastructure. Despite all of the attention that this issue has attracted, I suppose it is possible that the magnitude of the problem isn't fully understood. So let me share a shocking statistic with you. Back in 1959, when America scheduled its first transcontinental 707 between Los Angeles and JFK, it planned a block time of four hours and 45 minutes westbound and four hours even eastbound. Today, those times are six hours and 31 minutes and five hours and 40 minutes, respectively. Now, I cannot tell you how much of that 30% deterioration is due to operating at less than design speeds in order to save fuel, and how much is due to airways and runway congestion. But I can guarantee you that reducing the impact of congestion will produce a very handsome financial and environmental return on whatever investment is required. Despite that reality, things seem to be getting worse rather than better. Aviation Daily recently described the current year's budget request, quote, as seeking to patch holes created by chronic underinvestment and the 2013 sequester. The executive director of the FAA Managers Association recently wrote, quote, at the heart of this problem is the dysfunctional system for funding the FAA. And we are creating, increasingly creating, long-term problems. Michael Herta recently said in a speech, we are at a critical point in aviation where the decisions we make today will affect the industry for decades to come. I am frankly astounded by the industry's irresponsibility that those statements reflect. It seems to me that the broad outline of what should be done is widely known and generally accepted. Unhappily, we seem to have let politics, politics which is exhibited by industry participants who are unwilling to accept any compromise in order to get a deal, and politics represented by a Congress unwilling to offend anyone, no matter how ill-informed. And that politics has prevented the common sense steps that ought to be taken. It is long past time for the industry's major players, the airlines, the airports, the general aviation groups, and the manufacturers to put together a comprehensive plan based on compromises that everybody can live with and present that plan as a package to Congress along with a demand for prompt action. Last week at the Chamber's Summit, the Chairman of the House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, Bill Schuster, asked industry participants to do just that, to put petty politics aside and support his effort at a transformational bill. You know, for many years, Many in the industry have complained that there is a lack of political leadership. Now we have political leadership, but the industry still cannot seem to come together. First and foremost, it is time for the United States to accelerate its progress towards completion of what we call next gen and the rest of the world calls advanced air traffic management. NextGen is going to provide a host of benefits, which I think we all know about. Lower fuel usage, which means lower costs and reduced air pollution. Lower ATC costs as a consequence of more productive people working in fewer and newer facilities. 
reduced airspace and runway congestion, and more efficient use of airspace and runways. Like it or not, it seems quite clear that the FAA, for a variety of reasons, cannot and will not effectively implement NextGen. Thus, we need to take the ATO out of the FAA and create a self-supporting corporate entity to perform the ATC function. Now, as you all know, this is not a very radical proposal. Since many other countries, including Canada, the UK, Australia, and many others, have already taken similar steps. Now, once we have decided to move the ATO out of the FAA, we need to make some other choices. We need to decide how to pay for those ATC acti activities, <clears throat> how to finance the other functions of the FAA, and how to govern this new ATC provider. Fortunately, others have gone before us and have shown us ways that work. The new ANSP, which stands for Air Navigation Service Provider, would finance itself by charging user fees, which, everybody will be happy to know, would replace the existing excise taxes as the principal source of ATC financing. The fees would be set by the governing board, which would include representatives of the key aviation stakeholders commercial aircraft operators, general aviation, airports, and ATC employees, among others. And one great advantage of that arrangement is that the stream of user fees would be bondable, which would give the new ANSP far greater planning flexibility than the ATO or any other part of the FAA has today. This scheme has worked extremely well in Canada and other countries. It will work here, and it ought to be done this year. With ATO costs covered, the remaining issues involve deciding how to pay for the safety, safety oversight, certification, and airport support activities of the FAA. Since safety is a fundamental responsibility of the government, it would be entirely logical to pay for the safety oversight function out of the general fund. However, given the budgetary inanities of recent years and the increasingly challenging questions of public finance that lie ahead, an alternative approach would be to pay those bills with add-on charges to the user fees that will pay for ANSP activities. Or, alternatively, a second alternative would be to cover those costs with a segment fee similar to what we have today. Certification could, and it seems to me should, be supported by direct fees on those seeking service. And that leaves AIP, or, or the Airport Improvement Program, which currently costs about $3.5 billion per year, of which about one-half goes to major airports. Now, in recent years, the major commercial airport operators have made it quite clear that they are willing to give up AIP in exchange for higher PFCs. The airlines have objected, arguing that they prefer to pay for newer and larger facilities through higher rental charges and landing fees, although there is no perfect answer. It seems to me that the airports have the better part of this argument. In many cases, as you all know, our airports have lagged behind those in other countries, which disadvantages the U.S. in the competition for visitors and imposes less than optimum travel venues on passengers. The GAO, the General Accounting Office, has studied the impact of higher PFCs on passenger traffic and has found that higher charges have very little impact on the volume of travel. <coughs> Moreover, a good many international carriers, and IATA itself, believe that facility charges should be directly recovered from passengers. So I think that doing a deal to swap higher PFCs for AIP and building in provisions to give airlines some protection from airport grandiosity would be a good deal for the airports, for the airlines, for airline passengers, and for Mr. and Mrs. America, 
who do not want to travel through rundown, out of out of date airport facilities. That arrangement would leave only safety oversight, support for non-hub reliever and general aviation airports, and money to pay for miscellaneous administrative functions unfunded. I think most people who have studied the matter would assign all three to the general fund. But if general, if, if budgetary realities preclude that, a passenger segment fee would be a substitute source of funding for either safety costs or small airport support or both. However, those miscellaneous functions are funded. Arrangements along these lines would largely sever the financing link between the industry and the Congress. And it would free the industry to innovate and to grow. It is a deal that I would embrace in a heartbeat, and one that I hope today's leaders will think very seriously about. Another aspiration ought to be to reduce security hassles and costs. TSA has grown enormously over the years, but it has done very little to identify and eliminate ineffective aspects of its operations. There are now more than 50,000 TSA employees, thousands standing around, <coughs> deployed at more than 450 airports who collectively cost travelers and taxpayers $7.5 billion a year. Unhappily, a lot of that money is simply wasted. TSA spends about $200 million a year on behavior detection officers or BDOs in TSA speak. In November of 2013, the GAO reported that TSA had spent $900 million on the BDO program since its exception, but had not kept a single terrorist off any airplane or out of any airport. TSA also employs several thousand air marshals although we do not know what the actual number is since it's classified, although I cannot tell you why. What we know is that the TSA spends about $1 billion annually on the program, covers about 10% of all flights, and has averaged four arrests per year. That works out to about $250 million per arrest, <laughs> which is a pretty stiff price. A study done by Ohio State and the University of Newcastle estimates that the cost of a life saved by the Air Marshal Program would be $180 million, which is way more than the billion dollars that the OMB figures each of us is worth. Now, hardened cockpit doors work out to about $800,000 per life saved, which is less than the million dollars we're worth, which is why we have it. Whew. It's a good thing. The industry needs to push the Congress to take a very hard look at TSA. The agency's mission is important, but its implementation has been badly flawed. We do not need to spend $7 billion a year on airport security, and we ought to stop doing so. We should also stop handing our aviation markets and our aviation jobs to foreign airlines and service providers in other countries. I sometimes think, when I am reading comments about the U.S. economy, that some of our economic policymakers have, have lost track of the reality that in order to be a consumer, a person, person must first find a job and produce income. As everyone here today knows, the labor participation rate in the United States is far lower than it has been in times past. And the number of good jobs available in the country, jobs that pay a living wage and that provide both retirement and health benefits, is substantially smaller than it has been in prior years. Back in 1970, when I was working for TWA before moving to America, about 68% of national income went to labor and the remaining 32% went to capital. 40 years later, in 2010, those shares had become 62% for labor 
and 38% for capital. And that means that about a trillion dollars has moved from labor to capital between 1970 and 2010. As income flowed away from labor, household incomes atrophied. Between 1986 and 2013, median household income did not increase at all. Now, those dreadful numbers simply underscore how dramatic income inequality has become. There are many reasons for those changes, <clears throat> and examining all of them would turn these remarks into a seminar on economics that is way beyond the scope of my assignment. I will note, however, that some of the damage can be attributed to the misuse of open skies negotiations by the United States government and by the abuse of open skies treaties by some of the country with whom open skies have been agreed. In the years since 1992, the United States has signed open skies agreements with 111 foreign governments. <clears throat> and it has approached every one of those negotiations with the attitude that an open skies agreement is consistent with the best interests of the United States. I have never agreed with that approach, as there have been several agreements, which were at the time they were signed, and in the years since, have been clearly contrary to the interests of the U.S. carrier. I have never felt, and I do not feel now, that it makes any sense for our government to take the view that the interests of U.S. consumers should be served to the detriment of U.S. producers. To be blunt, I think good jobs are more important than low prices. Fair and equal competition is fine. Unfair and unequal competition, which allows international airlines to deprive U.S. airlines of the inherent advantages of our huge domestic market are inappropriate and damaging to our airlines and to our economy. In recent weeks, American and United and Delta have provided the U.S. government with information establishing that state-owned airlines in Qatar and the, and the UAE are receiving large subsidies from their state sponsors. Now, since the airlines in question would not be commercially viable without those subsidies, those companies, which are owned by governments which prohibit unions and which offer workers very few of the protections that we here in the United States consider normal, are stealing passengers from U.S. airlines. For reasons that escape me, a number of parties have leapt to the defense of the Gulf carriers, claiming that US, U.S. carriers seek protected markets. Those statements, in my judgment, are nonsense. The Gulf carriers are adding capacity at a rate which far exceeds passenger growth in the markets they serve. And they are using both excess seats and non-compensatory prices to take share from our carriers. Allowing those practices to continue will, in the long run, force U.S. carriers to withdraw from many international routes. That is going to mean both fewer airline jobs and, and I think this is much more important, U.S. carriers less able to sustain our economically indispensable domestic airline network, which we simply must have. We can and we should end the Gulf carrier charade. I hope that happens soon, and I hope as part of that exercise that we can persuade both the State Department and DOT to take a, to take a careful re-examination of all our open skies agreements around the world. I also hope that those now making policy decisions about U.S. aviation in both the private and the public sectors share my views about what the industry ought to be seeking to achieve in the years immediately ahead. It is a great business, but it can deploy and utilize its assets more efficiently, it can satisfy more of its customers, and it can make a larger contribution to the U.S. economy. I hope those run now running the business will achieve those aspirations, and I'll be cheering them on as they strive to do so. 
I thank you for your attention. <clears throat>
Well, I've been trying to understand you, myself, and American Airlines have been trying to let do is direct connection. Yes. Way. Let me answer your question this way. I understand that the airlines would rather sell tickets through their own sites rather than the sites of intermediaries. I also understand that they would rather not pay intermediaries when intermediaries arrange uh, bookings for the airlines. And so they've been suing one another back and forth, and they have, there's been a lot of language traded back and forth about what kind of computer code could be used, or protocols, could be used to display information for consumers. I, I am not on, on the, I'm not on, in that inner circle, so what I, I say this, as I said in my remarks, I think what airlines ought to do is be completely transparent, whether on their own sites or on the sites to which they provide information, they should, they should provide the full range of fees that a consumer might be asked to pay. I don't see any reason not to do that. The car rental companies can do it. I think the airlines can do it. I think the airlines should do it. And I think they would be better off telling the customer before he leaves home, rather than laying an extra $500 worth of charges on him at the airport, after he's got his wife, his grandmother, and three of his grandkids with him, he's going to, he's going to pay you the 500 bucks, but he's going to be madder than hell, and there's no point in it. All right? I think you answer it. I mean, OK, good deal. Thank, thank you. you very much, Bob. <laughs> thank you. Bob, I, I can't thank you enough. For those of you that were here last night uh, at, the, uh, at the dinner and the board meeting, you know that one of our initiatives, one of my initiatives for the club is to have it be a, a, an escalating a, a forum, as it was originally charted to do, for issues and matters. And I can't think of a more perfect introduction to that theme than you. So on behalf of the Wings Club, Bob, which you are past president of, I'd like to give you and present to you this small plaque. And I'll just read it. Presented to Robert Crandall, in grateful appreciation for your presentation at the Aviation Leader Series of the Wings Club, New York City, March 2015. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank, thank you. Guys. you. Thank you, and thank you all.